Welcome to Walk the Talk from Antriksh Bhavan in Bangalore, the headquarters of Indian Space Research Organization, where you see many smiles wherever you go, and nobody is smiling more happily than its chairman, Dr. K. Radhakrishnan. How are you? Congratulations, sir. And Thank you, know, you very much. One can't find uh, a space scientist with a more diverse portfolio. The Mars mission, the lunar mission, GSLV, and then your own tsunami warning center and the 24 by 7 disaster management center. Thank you. So you are a man of many parts. Indian space program is uh, people-centric and application-centric. That's our USP. Mm. But whatever we do, finally, it should find a place for the common man and society. That's why we see space applications using communication satellites, remote sensing satellites, navigation satellites, all now touching the life of people in the country. And you've had what, eight launches in seven months or something like that? Yes, since July 2013, we had all successful, eight flawless. successful missions. PSLVs, a few satellites, the Mars Orbiter mission, and the latest uh, GSLV D5 with Indian cryogenic engine, engine. and stage. Right. I know this model is not D5, but if you could explain to people who can't tell the difference between uh, geostationary, polar, anything. Uh, I mean, teach us some rocket science. Okay, essentially when we talk about a satellite doing remote sensing, it has to go above the Earth from pole to pole. Right. As the Earth rotates and the satellite also goes from pole to pole, the cameras in the satellite would be able to see the entire part of the Earth. Right. can take pictures as and when you require or periodically. If you want to look at the communication satellites, what we do is put a satellite at 36,000 kilometer altitude above the equator. Right. The satellite would take 24 hours for one revolution, which is equal to what we take for the Earth too. So the satellite will be geostationary, that is a stationary object with respect right. to us on the Earth. Right. So these are the two things that we generally talk about. Now, if you look at the Polar Satellite Launch Vehicle, that's the name of a satellite launch vehicle. Right. It can launch remote sensing satellites, it can launch satellites for space science experiments. It has also launched satellites for communication. Right. It has also launched our Chandrayaan right. and the Mars Orbiter that's spacecraft. Polar. These three are polar. are polar satellite launch vehicle. You will see a minor change well, I mean, that I, is I, I see, uh, yes. this one is a lot more uh, booster a lot less this is the core the... alone configuration of PSLV right and here we have got six strap-ons and here we have six but extended strap large strap-ons yes. yes so in the PSLV family we have three vehicles right now here we have the GSLV it's a more powerful vehicle right if you look at closely you will see the core stage of PSLV is used in GSLV right. also the second stage of PSLV is adapted and used in GSLV. More or less replicated. Yes, and here you will see large strap-ons. Right. These are liquid engine-based strap-ons, essentially deriving from, again, the same Vikas engine which we use. And I believe each one carries 200 tons of fuel. 40 tons each right. it carries. Right. And the core has 139 tons of solid propellant. But the most important and crucial element of GSLV is the cryogenic upper right. stage. Right. And that's what we tested. So, so now that I'm getting my tutorial on rocket science, tell us the meaning of cryo. I mean, no, cryo means something that's cold. Yeah, when we talk about the propulsion used for something rockets, that's extremely cold. Yeah, we have three varieties. One is you require a fuel and an oxidizer. This can be solid propellant based. That means you have the solid fuel and solid oxidizer plus a few additives. This can be used in the lower stages of the vehicle. Right. Easy to handle once you prepare it. But when you talk about the leakage engine, there is an oxidizer and there is a fuel. The fuel can be kerosene, it can be liquid hydrogen, and when it is liquid hydrogen, we call it cryogenics. And now you go on to your next GSLB from this. And if you look at the GSLB Mar 3, which you are now developing, right. It is far more powerful compared to the GSLV. In GSLV, we can put a 2,200 kilogram satellite into a geostationary transfer orbit. That means 
in an orbit where the apogee is 36,000 km, perigee is 200. Whereas in GSLE Mark 3, we can take to that orbit a satellite 4,000 kg. So almost double the capacity that we Sir, have. Perigee and, Apollo, and Apogee, if you, if you can explain. Perigee means uh, the distance closer to Earth. The, closer, the closer, closest point. Apogee is farthest the farthest point. point. So, so as it goes into elliptical orbit elliptical around orbit. the Earth, sometimes yes. it will be closer, sometimes it will be... Exactly. Exactly. And once you are putting the spacecraft into this kind of an orbit, finally it has to move into a circular orbit of 36,000 km. Right. So using the propulsion system in the satellite, we make it into a 36,000 km circular orbit and take it to a place above the equator. So for when are you planning this launch? The next landmark? The first landmark is an experimental mission where we will be looking at the atmospheric phase of this flight and we will use a passive cryogenic stage. In the sense, it won't ignite. Right. But all the lower stages will perform and we will monitor the performance of this vehicle in the crucial atmospheric phase. This is going to happen by April 2014. I see. And now... The and that, if I... I mean, my layman's sort of response, uh, please don't laugh if I'm completely wrong. Uh, by testing out its response to atmospheric sort of uh, conditions, you mean that the first 30, 40 kilometers, uh, it faced winds and pressures, and which don't exist in space anymore. You, you space said anymore. it rightly. If you look at the configuration of GSLV and PSLD, and look at GSLV Mark 3, you will see a clear difference. If you look at the height of the vehicle it's less, and the width of the vehicle, but it, it is, is much far, higher. Yes. And you have to look at the aerodynamic instability of this vehicle as it goes up. How do we control this? Right. And then how you transfer the thrust from these strap-on rockets to the main one. Right. All these have to be studied. And if you look at this strap-on, these two have to work almost in the similar fashion. And if they are dissimilar, the vehicle will get into controllability problem. So we have to also ensure that that takes place here. So uh, when do you expect the full launch of this? Full with, launch? With, 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 the, with the cryogenic here? Should be possible by 2016, 2017 oh. period. And then what we have done now is testing of this engine elements have started already. Right. Some of the stage components have also been tested. So the next two years we are going through a qualification program for the engine as well as the stage. Mm -hmm. Once it is completed, then we will be able to... Then we can launch much, much bigger satellites, yes. on, which we today have to go overseas. About 3,500 kilogram to 4,000 kilogram communication satellites right. we can launch. Today we do it through Ariane fire yes. rockets. Right. Yes. So, sir, what happened in the past? I know seven launches, uh, some successful, most not successful. See, if you Why look has at, GSLV given us such trouble? There are two reasons. GSLV, of course, is a beautiful vehicle and is a simpler vehicle, except for the complex cryogenic stage. And GSLV derives its heritage from the subsystems of PSLV yes. in terms of the solid core stage and the liquid strap-ons and the second stage. Number one, it uses the liquid propulsion where we need to get a lot of control components. This during the flight or during the preparation phase can give us a little bit of leak. That is one part of it. The second part is incidental. In the first uh, GSLE flight that was done in 2001, initially one of the strap-ons did not ignite. It did not get the fuel. But there was an inbuilt system for aborting the flight Mission. if there is anything abnormal. And that worked beautifully and the flight was aborted. Within 22 days, it was a record our people brought it back to the launch pad. And the whole thing was saved? Yes, and we had a good flight. But the satellite did not stay there for more than two months because the Russian cryogenic stage at that time did not perform to its required level. It's an underperformance of that stage. But nevertheless, it was the first developmental flight of GSLV and a very crucial milestone for the country. The second and third flights of GSLV did work very well. It launched GSAT 2 and GSAT 3 satellites. The EduSat that we right, talk about right. was launched by that. In the GSLV flight that we did in 2006, one of the components in a strap-on 
did not perform properly. The strap-on vigorously performed for the first 50 seconds and then it stopped. That means the vehicle had to go with only three strap-ons. And then finally we had to destroy, destroy. it. It was a failure. In the next flight that we undertook in the year 2007, the control system of one of the strap-ons failed. However, the vehicle was able to put the satellite into an orbit very close to where we wanted it. And then the satellite propulsion system was used to take the satellite into the right place. The INSAT 4CR was that satellite and it is still functioning well. So what you see here is nothing basically wrong with the GSLE, but component failure finally resulted in these few failures. In 2010, we had two flights. The first one was to test our Indian cryogenic engine end stage. Here to the vehicle beautifully performed up to the end of second stage, the cryo stage ignited. And when I say cryo stage ignited, there are four ignitions to take place. Two steering engines have to ignite first, and the main engine has to ignite, then a gas generator. This happened. We were all very happy at that time. But immediately after that, a fuel booster turbo pump stopped. And why did that happen, sir? Yeah, we investigated why it happened, the possible scenarios. We found there are three possibilities. One, of course, is contamination. <clears throat> it is sitting in a liquid hydrogen tank. It is at very low temperature. And How low when it's a very low temperature? It is 20 Kelvin, 273 minus 20. That is the kind of temperature that we deal with. And here we use uh, different types of materials and it contracts. And there are three bearings on which the shaft is kept. I think we might have about 20 scientists watching this. So please explain to the rest of us what do you mean by 20 Kelvin? If you look at, uh, uh, it is minus uh, 253 degrees uh -huh. centigrade. Right. That's the kind of temperature. Yes. So what happens is the fuel booster turbo pump is sitting at that temperature. Right. And there are dissimilar materials used in the pump and the contraction will not be uniform. So the bearings for these three shafts are given certain amount of clearances, assuming a kind of contraction. So whether it has been done correctly or not. That was the first point. We also had a possibility of a casing of this pump coming out. So these two had to be corrected. But later we found the most probable cause of that was contamination coming from a propellant acquisition system kept in the liquid hydrogen tank. So we replaced that, we redesigned and got a new one. We also tested this pump extensively in this low temperature condition and ensured that it works. The second part of it was, had this pump worked? Are we sure that the rest of the functions will take place? We did a lot of analysis and simulation. And one of the things we wanted to make sure before we take off again was to see that this cryogenic engine ignites and we are sure about it at this high altitude condition where there is vacuum. We had not tested this in the past on the ground. We were making certain assumptions and doing a modeling to ensure that. But here we created a test facility at Mahendragiri and then we tested it and saw to it that we yeah. are confident about so it. So that's why this launch with an Indian cryogenic engine is such a Landmark, so three it? years of work, three years 45 of work. tests on the ground we did during these three years on the cryogenic engine and stage and its elements before we came up. And also we looked at the GSLE configuration, why it failed? Right. Is there anything fundamentally wrong with this configuration? Right. We did nearly 850 wind tunnel tests. But now you don't have a doubt. Now we don't have a doubt. It has right. worked. Right.